Welcome, everyone. Let's just um, bow our hearts with a word of prayer, and then we'll start singing. Lord God, I thank you that, that you love us so much. God, that you just give us so many blessings every single day. Lord, open our eyes to see how blessed we really are and to just turn around and thank you and thank you again for your great love for us. And uh, may this time of worship be a thank you as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. 
Now you can be seated. Him we will say he is 
quaked before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken from my regard through it all
be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Father God, it's only because of our hope in you that we can sing those words tonight. It is well with my soul because my soul is yours. And Lord, may our eyes be fixed on you tonight as we read your word. May our hearts be open to more of you through your word, Lord 
penetrate our hearts, our minds, get past all those barriers that we put up. Change us, Jesus, to be more like you. Encompass your arms around us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay, Zechariah. Zachariah. So we're in chapter 11 now, so you can turn there, and this is the worthless shepherd we're calling this. Chapter 11 seems to speak about the consequences of rejecting Jesus at his first coming. Uh, remember, the Babylonian captivity is already over. They are back in the land. The temple has been rebuilt at this point in time. So this chapter is a chapter of judgment, but it seems to fit another judgment after the Babylonian uh, captivity that goes even beyond a near fulfillment to an end times fulfillment as well. So we're going to see uh, both involved there. So let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word today, Lord, and uh, just pray that you would open up the pages of your word to our hearts and uh, that you would teach us today, Lord. God, thank you for us gathering together, even though we're few, we're strong in you, in Jesus' name. And uh, so we'll have that element of it, and then toward the end of the chapter, we're going to zoom ahead prophetically to the worthless shepherd, or the Antichrist. And so remember, the book of Zechariah is highly prophetic, a highly prophetic book. Some have said that the prophecy of Zechariah is to the Old Testament what Revelation is to the New Testament. And it's true, it's very, very uh, prophetic. So de dealing with things back then, but also prophetically right into the future as well. So chapter 11, open your doors or open your gates, O Lebanon, the fire may devour, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. So uh, you get the idea that uh, armies are going to come in, basically, and just kind of wipe out the land, you know, uh, devastate all the cedars, the trees, and all of that. Now, this judgment uh, in this chapter, most believe is speaking of 70 A.D., when the Romans came into Jerusalem and came through the doors of Lebanon, the gates of Lebanon, and killed over 1,100,000 Jews. That's how many Jews died in that. Another half a million uh, died as a result of the, uh, of the war. And then uh, the rest of the Jews were scattered all over the world. And uh, the temple was destroyed during that. And that was all the result of them rejecting the Messiah. I mean, that's, that was the judge. That's where the judgment came from. The cedars of Lebanon, the rabbis believed to be speaking of the temple because cedars from Lebanon were used in the building of the temple. And uh, so this is judgment on Jerusalem, judgment on uh, the temple. And Isaiah talks about the cedars of Lebanon as well as the oaks of Bashan as a symbol that's everything proud. It's a symbol of pride, a symbol of loftiness, of being exalted, you know, because cedars are so majestic kind of a thing. So in essence, what's going on here is a judgment that brings devastation to the land. And this would fit the Roman siege in 70 AD perfectly. Verse 4, thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. Now, some feel that Zechariah is actually acting this out as he goes. And here he would be representing the Messiah, but that he's acting it out. 
So the Messiah was given the task of feeding the flock for the slaughter. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Feed the flock for slaughter, because that's exactly what Jesus did when he came. He fed the flock, but they rejected him, so he was feeding them for the slaughter. Remember when he came down on Palm Sunday down the Mount of Olives, he looked over Jerusalem and he wept. And he cried because they didn't recognize the day of their visitation. They didn't recognize that he was uh, coming uh, to uh, them. And then he predict, predicted that not one stone would remain on another because they didn't recognize the time of his coming. And when the Romans came in, that's exactly what happened. They killed 1.1 million Jews, scattered the rest. They burned everything in the temple. And then to get all the melted gold, they dismantled the stones because the gold had melted into the cracks of the stones and they threw the stones down into the Kidron Valley. And so uh, this was all fulfilled to the T. And this was, again, the consequence of them rejecting the Messiah. Verse 6. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord, but indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, and they shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. So remember the Jews, instead of believing in Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords, they said, we have no king but Caesar. Remember that? And so God says here, I'm going to give you into his hands. I'm going to give you into the hands of your king and into the hands of your neighbors. So again, this appears to be speaking of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. But also, looking ahead prophetically to the time of the Antichrist, because these types of things are going to happen again in our future. Verse 7. So, I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty, or it could be translated favor in some of your Bibles, or grace. And the other I called bonds, or ties, or unity. And I fed the flock. So two staffs were used by the shepherd, by the good shepherd here. Two staffs, that's what shepherds used back then. They used two staffs, one to fight off predators and another to guide the sheep. And so in Psalm 33 it says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, two staffs, that's what the shepherds uh, used. And so here the staffs are given the symbolic names of beauty or grace or pleasantness and bonds or bands or ties, speaking of unity, showing God's grace and beauty toward his people and the union of Israel and Judah that they once had. But God is saying, I fed the flock for slaughter. This was, again, a judgment that took place because of their rejection. Verse 8. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. What does that mean exactly? Not really sure, because it doesn't spell it out. But it could possibly be speaking of the three branches of leaders of the Jews, the three shepherds. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Could be talking about that. All three of these were done away with after 70 AD. There was no longer a need for them. Or it could also represent the prophets, the priests, and the kings who had the responsibility of leading the people but didn't do it. Worshiped idols instead. Uh, Whoever God is talking about here, they abhorred Jesus and God's soul loathed them. Two different words being used there. The word loathe on God's part means to uh, be short or to lose patience with. But the word abhorred on their part toward God means to loathe to the point of nausea. In other words, they were sick of God. They had had it. They wanted nothing to do with him. 
verse 9. And then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. So Titus besieged Jerusalem for a brutal five months in which the Jews had no food. And Josephus, the historian, records the famine and the cannibalism that took place during the siege where the women killed and ate their own nursing children and cooked them. And in fact, I would read it to you out of Josephus, but it's really quite graphic and it makes me sick. So I'm not going to read that. I'll spare you from that. But that's not the first time the Bible warns in the book of Deuteronomy that cannibalism would be part of the judgment because they rejected God. And they did this during the Babylonian captivity as well. So they did it during that captivity. They did it during the siege of the Romans. And uh, history repeats itself. Verse 10. And I took my staff, beauty, and cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I made with all the people. So beauty or grace or favor is being broken in two. Are you, are you catching what's he, what he's saying here? And so it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. So God's protection, his favor, his beauty, his grace was broken that day when the Romans slaughtered the Jews. He was no longer protecting them they no longer had favor only the believing remnant understood that it was the word of the lord lindsay writes in his commentary the revoked covenant symbolized by breaking the staff called favor or beauty had uh, been made with all the nations apparently to secure god's providential protection of israel the divine disfavor on Israel because of her rejection of the true shepherd resulted in spiritual blindness, according to Romans 11, and national destruction and dispersion. Only the believing remnant, the afflicted of the flock, who recognized Jesus as the true Messiah, understood his true origin in God. Now watch this. Great prophecy, great a uh, couple of verses coming up here uh, that are so accurate, it's stunning. Verse 12, and then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. So Zechariah is acting this out, right? He's acting all of this out. And so God is saying here, what am I worth to the people? What's my worth to the people? And this is an incredible prophecy of Jesus being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That's what he was worth to the people. And this was the payment for a slave that was gored by an ox in the New Testament. It was like the lowest, uh, you know, payment for a slave, basically. And that's the value that they placed on the Messiah. Silver speaks of redemption and blood in the Bible. And so 30 pieces of silver for a slave that was gored by an ox, it was blood money. It says the silver would be thrown into the house of the Lord for the potter, which sounds like double talk, doesn't it? it sounds kind of weird. Thrown into the house of the Lord for the potter. But it's incredibly accurate to what exactly happened over 500 years later after this was written. So let's look at it. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. But that's not, that's not the, the uh, cool part. Chapter 27, verse 3. 
Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple or the house of the Lord and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. See, they recognized this was the price of blood for a slave. And they consulted together and bought with them what? The potter's field. So the money was thrown into the house of the Lord for the potter to bury strangers in. And therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and then we get our verse here from Zechariah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, uh, whom they uh, of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So Matthew says that the quote is from Jeremiah. We just saw it was from Zechariah. So many people say, well, there's a contradiction in the Bible. See, the Bible's wrong. It has errors in it and all of that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Zechariah's words don't mention the purchase of a field. But Jeremiah's words do. In fact, it's in Jeremiah who speaks of innocent blood and changing the name of a potter's field. And it's in Jeremiah who per actually purchases a potter's field himself. He's directed to do it. So Jeremiah's prophecy contributed to Matthew's citation. But also in the ancient order of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, the way it was ordered, Jeremiah was the first book of the prophets. And so within the book of Jeremiah came Zechariah. And so it, all those books were referred to as the, prof, the prophecy of Jeremiah, even though it could have been Zechariah or one of the other books. Are you following me? It would be like me saying, uh, Jesus said it's better to give, or it's better to give than receive, Right? Well, do you know Jesus never said that in the Gospels? Paul says it and quotes it in the book of Acts, and he says that Jesus said it. So we can say Jesus said it's better to give than receive, even though Jesus never said it in the Gospels. Paul said it, and it was handed down to him somehow. So incredible accuracy concerning Jesus' betrayal acted out by Zechariah 500 years before it happened. 30 pieces of silver thrown into the house of the Lord for the potter. And Jesus' blood money ended up buying that field for strangers or the field of blood. And that, there's a whole nother sermon in that altogether. Because the Bible says that he is the potter and we are the clay. We belong to him, you see. He bought us. Verse 14, then I cut into my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So after 70 AD, well, the Jews were scattered all over the world and that distinction between Israel and Judah no longer existed and the bonds were broken. Now we shift into the future right to the Antichrist as a contrast to the true shepherd or the good shepherd. They rejected the real Messiah or the true shepherd, but they're going to receive the worthless shepherd. Verse 15, and the Lord said to me, next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, 
nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. And so this is going to be a specific, false, foolish shepherd that is yet to be seen, still in the future, who is the Antichrist. And notice the Antichrist will be a shepherd in the land. The Jews are going to accept him as a shepherd over them. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name and him you will receive. And he, the Antichrist, no doubt, is going to help the Jews rebuild their temple because ultimately he wants to go into the, te- the, te- the temple and declare to be God and worshiped as God. He's going to seem to have all the answers at first, but they're going to find out he's a false shepherd. And so verse 17, woe to the worthless shepherd. Now watch this, pay attention. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. Watch this. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither. And his right eye shall be totally blinded. Now we'll come back to that. But the Antichrist doesn't really care about the flock. Paul said that during the tribulation, they're going to be sent a strong delusion that they would believe the lie. What lie? Well, the lie that Satan has always given from the beginning. You can become like God. You can be God, basically. And it's a lie that he wanted to be. He wants to be like the most high. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to try to be like the most high God and get people to worship him. He's going to go into the rebuilt temple, which no doubt he'll help to rebuild, and he's going to be demand to be worshipped. Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. What do you think? Is that happening right now? Is the falling away coming first? And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, only two people call that in the Bible, Judas and the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And this is what Satan wants, guys. He wants to be worshipped as God blatantly. Not secretively. Blatantly. And it will be blatant. But look at... um, Verse 17 again. Notice he's called the worthless shepherd, and that word worthless means an idol. He's an idol shepherd, or a shepherd who will set up an idol. Could take it that way too. And notice it says, a sword shall be against against his arm and against his right eye, and his arm shall completely wither, and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So this appears to be the only physical description we have of the Antichrist in the Bible. And symbolically, the arm indicates his strength and the eye his intelligence, but I believe this is a physical description. Something is going to happen to the Antichrist, to his arm and to his right eye, and I believe it shows up in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 where it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This is the Antichrist. Having seven heads and ten horns, the authority that he has over the nations, and on his horn ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which I saw was like a a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. Who's the dragon? Satan, of course. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and notice, great authority. Great authority 
over the earth. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all of the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And then verse 11 says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The Antichrist is not going to act alone. There's two of them. There's going to be this other beast that comes out of the earth. This will be a religious leader who supports the beast, the Antichrist. So it'll be a religious leader who supports a political leader. Interesting. We see that happening all the time right now in our day and age. And uh, where am I? Oh, he came up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Notice again, whose deadly wound was healed. This is not allegory. This is physical. This is real. He performs great signs so that even he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has, was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So now we get the sword pulled into it, which is what it says in Zechariah. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark, watch this, on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. So a false trinity, right? Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. It's the number of man. So 666 is a false trinity. Now, Zechariah said that his arm would be completely withered and his right eye totally blinded. Now, think about this. Where is the mark of the beast going to be? Yep. Isn't that interesting? In those two spots where the uh, Antichrist is going to be Wounded, the forehead and the right hand. Could this be why his loyal followers receive the mark on their right hand or on their forehead? Because they are identifying themselves with him. Instead of identifying themselves with the wounds of the true shepherd, the wounds of the Messiah of Jesus Christ, they will identify themselves with the wounds of the Antichrist instead. And their fate will be sealed. They will willingly do this, folks. They will know what they are doing and they will identify themselves with him. It will be blatant. Satan doesn't want secret worship. He wants outward worship. And he's going to go for it in the tribulation. Now, I personally believe the Antichrist will not be revealed until after the rapture of the church. You know, today there are groups and organizations that hate Christians, and it's getting worse. They hate us because we're, we're hindering their agenda. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're restraining them from doing what they want. And these groups want Christians out of the way. And you know what? I believe that's exactly what God's going to do. He's going to take us out of the way. When Christians are taken out of the way at the rapture, evil is going to run its full course 
because he who restrains will be taken out of the way. That's exactly what Paul the Apostle says. Watch this. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Watch this, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So notice, he who restrains will be taken out of the way and then the Antichrist will be revealed. And I believe that he who is taken out of the way is the Holy Spirit's influence through the church. And when the church is out, oh man, all hell is going to break loose on this earth, quite literally. And the Antichrist will be revealed. So in this chapter, chapter 11, we see the rejection of Jesus Christ who was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, incredible accuracy, thrown into the house of the Lord for the potter. And we also see the acceptance of the worthless shepherd, the Antichrist, also incredible accuracy. His wound, his fatally, you know, uh, he's going to be fatally wounded, but yet come back to life somehow. And, it's, and the world's going to go, wow, all right you know, and identify themselves with him. Wow. Now, chapter 12, next time, uh, which is filled with significance. In fact, read chapter 12 in advance if you can and get familiar with it because it's in Ze Zechariah 12 where it says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the world or a cup of drunkenness. And it also says in chapter 12 that I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. So interesting prophecies in Zechariah chapter 12. Get familiar with it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, um, for your word today. So incredible, so exciting. Uh, as we uh, look at those things uh, in the past and in the future. Wow, Lord, you've spelled it all out, and we just praise you for that. And may we meditate on these things as we leave this place and go in your peace, in your grace, in the unity of Christ and the unity of the church right, right now, Lord. And um, that we um, would bring that unity with us into the world around us. And thank you, Lord for your love for us, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what you did for us, Lord. Betrayed for the price of a slave. That's the price that they put on you. God help us. God forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. This world is not what it was meant to be All this pain, all this suffering There's a better place waiting for me in heaven Every tear will be wiped away Every sorrow and sin erased We'll dance on seas of amazing grace In heaven, in heaven I'm going home where the streets are golden Every chain is broken Oh, I want to go arms where I belong home lay down my burdens I lay down my past I run 
to Jesus, no turning back. Thank God Almighty, I'll be free at last in heaven, in heaven. I'm going home where the streets are golden, every chain is broken. Oh, I want to go, oh, I want to go home where every fear is gone. I'm in your open arms where I belong. Blinded eyes will finally see the dead will rise on the shores of eternity. The trump will sound, the angels will sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. I am going home where the streets are golden, every chain is broken, oh I want to go.